Welcome to our live webinar, A Candid Conversation with Caregivers. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, patient educator, and I'll be moderating the presentation today along with my colleague, Julie Powers. As we get started, I'd like to recognize the generous support of our corporate sponsors, as well as the patients, caregivers, and family members for supporting our program today. Due to the high volume of teleconferences on the internet, it is possible you may lose your connection during the program. If you're unable to view the webinar, you can call in using the call-in number in your reminder email to listen to the program. Today's program will be archived to our website within two to three business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following um, during the, our conversation today, you can submit your questions or comments using the small text box window located in the bottom part of your screen. To submit a question or a comment, just open the Q&A window, which is the small text box window, type in your question or comment, and we'll be asking your questions during the webinar today. When asking your questions or leaving comments, please do two things to help me manage the incoming questions. First, submit your question or comment all at the same time. Second, please don't share any private health information. Uh, we won't be able to share that. And please remember that our panelists today are caregivers, uh, such as you or those caring for you, not medical professionals. So we won't be answering any medical questions today. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have Allison Hines, Sandra Asher, and Jeffrey Sozik. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and give them the opportunity uh, to introduce themselves as well and tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, Allison, would you like to start? Hi, um, my name is Allison Hines, and I am the wife of uh, a plastic anemia patient. Um, however, when he was first diagnosed, I was not his wife, I was his girlfriend. So, um, of course, there's a nice story there. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to say anything else, or is that just it, that I'm the wife? Sure, we'll go ahead and get into that next. Okay. Uh, Sandra, would you like to go next? Jeffy, you want to go, go, go ahead and go? Okay, I'm the caregiver. My wife was diagnosed with a severe plastic anemia almost 10 years ago. To okay. Almost 10 years. Um, it was November of 2010. My wife was feeling very sluggish, brought it to the doctor. The doctor basically said, she's sick, we'll do a blood test. Before we left the doctor's office, they had done the blood work and uh, the prognosis was not exactly good. My, it, suffice to say, my wife asked the doctor a question, will she live? And he didn't respond. And based upon the way the numbers were, she had a perfect three on every number you can imagine. He suggested we go immediately to uh, Robert Wood, which is in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And we ran there, and I didn't know whether or not by the end of the day, whether or not she'd still be alive. Luckily, we ran and got to the emergency room. Everyone was waiting for us, and obviously she did survive. But it was a shock, um, and um, it's an experience I would not, I remember very, very vividly. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons, which unfortunately I never wanted to learn, if that explains it. Thanks, Jeff. Sandra, would you like to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. Um, I haven't figured out how to get my picture up, but at least we've got the sound up. Um, <laughs> my husband, Mike, uh, was a uh, Krav Maga trained gym rat never sick a day in his life, um, career Air Force pilot, rah-rah Steve Canyon type, and um, one day was found unconscious in an elevator. And uh, seven days later, we found out that he had MDS. 
uh, that was five years ago, five and a half years ago. He had a bone marrow transplant, which failed. And he very uh, quickly transitioned to AML with an extremely poor diagnosis. And his local doctor said, sorry, nothing more we can do. He's still here. So obviously there was something else that could be done. And I imagine we'll get to that as the, the uh, webinar goes on. Thank you. Allison, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, Mario's getting diagnosed? Yes. So um, actually, Mario was not ill at all. He was um, and interesting because what Sandra just said, um, Mario was sparring with his martial arts friends and he came home and he had all these bruises. And I said to him, my gosh, you got your butt kicked. And he's like, yeah, I know. I don't understand. So, and again, he felt fine. He just had these large bruises. And then two days later, he had to get a filling and it didn't stop bleeding. And I was an EMT. So to this day, I kicked myself that I wasn't putting this all together, but I wasn't. And then a couple of days later, we were out looking for Halloween costumes and he kept going to the bathroom. And I'm like, that's weird. So then we come home and he's like, I, I have to tell you something. And I thought, oh, he's breaking up with me. And he says... <laughs> I think I might be peeing blood. And I said, you think? I said, well, let me see, you know, cause I don't, I don't care, right? It was like, if you would have poured fruit punch in the toilet. So what was happening was now we know his platelets were so low, he was bleeding internally. So, you know, same thing as I'm sure everybody, you know, he, he just went to the Medi clinic, they ran some blood work. They thought that he had an injury to his spleen because if you would, damage your spleen, it's gonna hoard your platelets. So they sent him for an ultrasound. While we were in the waiting room for the ultrasound, they called and said, get immediately to the ER. And also I remember what I was wearing that day and it was 2008. So um, it's definitely something that you never will forget. Um, and then all the steps you know, after that led us to NIH and to the foundation. So obviously if you're watching this, you've already found the foundation, but that was, um, they, they were an R, our saving grace. So um, that's kind of how we got, you know, it started for Mario. Oh, thank you. So before you became a caregiver for your loved ones, what did you think the role of caregivers was? Like what was your perception of caregivers and now that you've been caring for your loved one after they've been diagnosed with a bone marrow failure disease, how has that perception of caregivers changed for you? Mm. Interesting. Can anybody go? Uh, sure, yeah. Allison, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I, I wanna say that I always thought of a caregiver always 100% taking care of the person who's ill. Prior to being a caregiver, I really never thought much about what the caregiver needs, um, right? Caregiver, I am caring for someone, but I never thought about the care that the caregiver continues to need as also a person who is going through something very traumatic and emotional. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's what I would say. Jeff? Sandra, I know Sandra wanted yeah. to <laughs> say. Yeah. My turn? Okay. Sure. Um, I thought of caregiving like you do with an infant, just all encompassing all the time. Um, and I found it very difficult when you're dealing with another adult who doesn't surrender themselves totally to your wishes and who isn't always as compliant about every little thing as you would be. So that took a while. It's almost like um, dealing with somebody going through the terrible twos. <laughs> you know? I know what's best for you now quit fighting me on this. So uh, we had to make some changes. And sometimes I just had to put my foot down and say, I'm sorry, you don't understand. And this is what has to be done. But other times I really had to back up and bite my tongue. He's a grown man. Jeff? 
It, it's interesting because as a caregiver, as I said, this is something that we never anticipated. Uh, winding up to um, making decisions because Linda was not in a position to make a decision. We didn't know what to do. It was sort of like, you do this or she dies. You do that and she lives. Uh, and it was a question of making decisions very quickly and trying to understand what was going on. They did diagnose her with aplastic for three months, but it took about 10 days to stabilize her in, in the hospital. And one of the things which I regret is you had social workers and other people coming and saying they do this or do that. Um, dietitians coming into the room. And it's very weird, but you don't know what's going on when people say we could help you do financial aid or dietary aid or whatever. For what? We didn't know what was going on. And it was very difficult from the beginning. You know, I'm looking back retroactive 10 years ago. Um, but it was sort of like a whirlwind going from everything is, should we go to Walmart or should we go to Sam's Club or do we go to the ER type of event? And it just went on for months upon months upon months. She didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, but we were learning very, very quickly. Um, and you have to make certain decisions, which you're not really prepared for, but you start to realize that you have to look very, you have to make decisions. And you're hoping that those decisions are the correct decisions. Uh, in, in regards to, I'm not sure, what I needed was someone to speak to, which I didn't have. Uh, she was totally reliant upon my, her advice, decisions. And I was just hoping that I was making the right one, the ones that made the most sense. Because uh, you have doctors during the initial uh, hospital stay, they were coming in doing different testing and not knowing it was a, they weren't sure if she had leukemia or a severe aplastic. So all I know is it says it was whatever the diagnosis was, leukemia sounded worse than aplastic. Uh, but you learn and until Linda got in touch with the organization, and started forming, uh, started the support group that she did. Uh, we never knew that there are other people who actually had a problem. It was sort of not that easy. We knew that we found out about the Aplastic Anemia Association uh, at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey because they had an exhibit and they had brochures. Uh, but until the support group came about, the things that she had gone through we didn't realize that other people had actually gone through. And when we met Mario, uh, it was, and his story and Allison, uh, we realized that what decisions were made were basically okay. And that's one of the things I think is the problem is, who do you ask if you go to somebody and say someone has aplastic anemia, they say, oh, take iron pills. And that's the sole extent of it. So I, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Thank you so much. And I know you all kind of mentioned, um, you know, the the trying to help with caregiving, uh, especially when you're dealing with adults. <laughs> um, what are some things that you tips that you think that you learned that may be helpful because sometimes it can be very difficult as Allison mentioned when you're dealing with your own emotions that your loved one has just been diagnosed but still trying to be supportive of the patient and be present so what are some of those things that you did to help yourself deal with the news that your loved one had a, a life-threatening bone marrow failure disease I have to say, I love what Sandra said about it's like you think it's like a child and then it's an adult who might not be as compliant as a child. Um, and I, I think that that what she said really hit home because I felt I was in that situation um, several times where and remember, I was the girlfriend at the time. Um, 
you, you do have to remember that. You do have to remember that this is an adult that we're assisting and that you can provide information and maybe your opinion, but at the end of the day, they have to decide what is right for them. Mm -hmm. So I just loved when she said that. I said, oh, that's great. But as for me, um, you know, Mario was at, in the hospital for a long time and it was New Brunswick. So at the time, this was well before COVID, um, my friends would actually meet me for dinner in New Brunswick. And I would think that the hospital was my house because I'd leave the house, I'd go meet them for dinner and then I'd walk back to the hospital. So, you know, and that's just a one little example, but I do feel that as the caregiver, you do still need to make that time to talk to or meet with friends or other family. Um, you know, the, the sick person is in the hospital or at home sick and, and they have, that's their job, right? Their job is to get better and to, and to do what the doctors tell them and to take their medicine and all of that. Our job is to continue to work, to do laundry, to take care of kids if you have, you know, you still need to do everything outside of the home or the hospital as well as assist them. So your life is also in a big roller coaster. So you do have to make sure that you do those things that you enjoy and get that break as well. Uh, Sandra, I like what Allison said about that. That's good. Um, we made a, a deal after a while. We said it's going to be a partnership. You're not going to go through this by yourself. This is a partnership. And here's how we're going to break it down. You're going to do the heavy lifting and I'm going to take care of all the details. And that includes keeping the house going, paying the bills and worrying. And I'll let you know if there's anything you need to worry about. But for right now, your job doing the heavy lifting is like she said, take your medicine, you know, get better sleep, all the things that are important, but you have to kind of have some ground rules there. Otherwise, I think the patient's mind just gets so caught up in details and worry that it, it inhibits them getting better. So he tells me now that knowing that I would let him know if it's something he needed to worry about really freed him up. Mm -hmm. And he also says that me having a smile on my face and not showing any tears made a big difference to him, even when things went really bad and he was close to death. So that's important to hear after the fact. You don't really know when you're going through it, whether you're doing the right thing or not. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything to add? Jeff, you Oops. need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Oops. Uh, Jeff, you're on mute. Can you hear me? I don't. On the uh, bottom left. Uh, there, there you go, go Jeff. I Sorry, know. you were on mute. Uh, it was such a whirlwind for the first six months that it wasn't a question of what should I do, whatever. All I knew is that I needed to keep her safe. And I know that during a lot of the doctor's visits, since it was sort of an ongoing event, uh, I needed to make sure that we, the doctors, I had to be there when she was being, when she was, the doctors were seeing her. Uh, because when she was, the doctors would say things to her, which is I think what's important to realize is that she was on such drug medication that she wasn't really cognizant of, she would hear things, but they, with the transfusions and the um, uh, Benadryl, and she was not 100% there. And uh, she was, so to make sure that I was always there to make sure what the doctors said, what they wanted to do, that I was making, that I was aware and that we both agreed on, on it. Uh, because I found out, and this is, I'm quite sure other people have realized is that the doctors come in, they're on a quick schedule and they want to do X, Y, and Z. And here's option A, option B, and option C. And what do you want to do? And, uh, 
it was very hard, very hard to make those decisions very quickly. And sometimes we wound up delaying certain things which turned out to be best. I'm not sure if that explains, but it was very, very hard. And not having anybody to really speak to, I had a brother I'd speak to on the phone, helped me there with me while all this was going on. Um, it's helpful to have friends. I didn't have any, nobody was coming to the hospital or on the visits. That makes it very, very hard. Uh, you want to be able to do other things, but what do you do? Is I go for dinner or do I stay there? Every time I seem to have gone to dinner at the hospital, the doctors would run in and come up with the, the what the thoughts were or the diagnosis for that particular day. Uh, it's very hard, especially when you if you have a family group, a support group, it's a lot easier. Uh, when you're alone and you're older, which is what you are, uh, it's very difficult to, um, it, it's, it's, I don't know, it was just very, very hard. And as I said, until the support came about, not realizing that a lot of the decisions that we made were basically the right decisions. And you always second guess yourself. Education's the key, don't you think? Uh, for a is, caregiver to, to chase away the fear, not just with the patient, but for the caregiver, it's the education. It's the not knowing what the heck is in store that is awful. So that's why this organization is wonderful. Um, I would take notes. I'm an accountant, you know, I, I just love details. So I would start reading from all the major hospitals and major organizations take notes something i didn't understand there's a question mark in the margin and then i'd go back to his doctors and say here's five different uh, organizations and they all have different opinions about this what do you think so after a while i found myself a lot more comfortable and settled down and the worry was not there anymore now because mike's situation was not acute at the beginning that afforded me some time to be educated. I think Jeff's situation was entirely different. He had no time. He was just thrown into the midst of it. So, um, and Allison, I guess somewhat the same with you. Um, but then I found the difference later after Mike's transplant failed and his doctor said, I'm sorry, he's only got weeks to live. Um, all of a sudden we were thrown into the situation that Jeff's in. Um, so all that education helped, but then we went to a different disease and it was, it started all over again. Thank you. We do have a question from the audience and this is actually coming from a patient and this person says, um, they are an MDS patient. I love my wife and she's an excellent caregiver. However, she does not let me do anything for myself, including yep. putting on my shoes. Yep. Any advice on how I can talk to her without hurting her feelings? I do love her and she's the best. How do I help her understand that I can do things for myself without hurting her? It, she's not on the call? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, you I have think to be honest. Yeah, and I think Sandra was saying before too how they had a, a conversation. You know, I something, and that's what we were talking about before that we, as the caregiver, we do have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful that, you know, we're dealing with an adult who is capable of doing things and you have to let them do it. So, in your situation, because it's a little bit reversed, you would very nicely, you know, tell her, listen, watch, you watch me do it. And if you don't think I can do it, then you can help me. Watch me put on my left shoe. Watch me, like maybe let her show her, say, listen, let me do it. And if you think I can't do it, then let me know. But look, I can do it. Like maybe you have to say, I'm going to show you what I can do. Yeah. Yeah. Or make a deal. If I need help, I'm going to ask you. And then follow through, you know. Jeff, any any advice? I, while, Jeff is, while Jeff is unmuting, I just have a really quick, funny story. 
um, when Mario, after his ATG and all, he had cheeks, right? So he got, made himself tea, I let, right? He made himself tea and he was going to go upstairs with the tea like this. I said, Mario, would you like me to carry that upstairs for you? He's like, no, I got it. As he spilled tea all the way up the stairs. Oh, well, it dried, right? But, you know, I let him do it. He said he could do it. So he had half a cup of tea. <laughs> uh, Jeff? I found out that uh, Linda was extremely weak and uh, was in between transfusions. The day after the transfusion, she was very capable of doing it. She would lose energy and that was time for the transfusion. It, it, just do it. I would just say just do it. Don't uh, wait around. It's, I wouldn't go to the extent of, uh, you know, if Linda needed help, she would help. But uh, never to that extent. Uh, I, but at least you know they care. That's the important thing. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Sandra, this will probably be for you. Um, it says, as a patient heading into a transplant in January, how dependent are you on your caregiver when you return home? Completely. Uh, now, these days, some folks are getting out a lot earlier than they used to be when we had, Mike had his. I say we, because it really happened to both of us. Um, but around 30 days afterwards, a profound fatigue hits. And while Mike had a real easy time in the hospital, virtually no side effects, he got home and it was a different story. Just sitting up in bed was hard. Doing everything was hard. Uh, so for us, it was important that I be right there next to him. I moved a, my recliner in right next to his so that I could be there every second to help until he started getting a little better and started chafing a little bit. You know, I can do this. I can do this. Uh, so there's a fine line you're going to walk between needing to provide 24-7 and needing to kind of back off a little bit. It's something you're going to have to decide for yourself, but it's imperative that you have a caregiver. Mike would get sick in the middle of the night, not in the daytime. No, it was always something terrible in the middle of the night that would happen. Um, so you really have to be there. Now, I have to admit that um, I got very little sleep. It was, it was much like having a newborn. You're not sure that you know how to take care of them. You think you might, but you're not positive and you have to be on alert. And then little by little that, uh, that backs off. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, what would you do if you're, or how did you handle when your loved one um, was not eating or was not necessarily eating healthy? Um, how did you monitor or how did you address th those um, situations? Like I was saying, Maria was a fitness person, so um, that wasn't too much of a concern. But in the beginning, too, if you are like neutropenic, you can't have a lot of the fresh things. But maybe in this situation, I don't know who shops for the house. I don't know your specific situation, but maybe it could be something where you're you're just going to prepare the meals that are a little bit healthier, or are they sneaking food? I'm not sure um, you know, what's happening there, but it might be something where you could just only buy the foods that you think that would be um, you know, beneficial and do that cooking instead of letting them cook maybe. Uh, Sandra, did you, would your you doctor have like something should to add? give you the doctor should give you uh, 
a list of things uh, leading up to transplant time is one thing. After transplant, it's a whole different other thing. There are definitely uh, a lot of rules and regulations to follow. Um, but the thing that I would really advise people, and I do it all the time, is don't make this a power struggle. Don't go back to the two-year-old. You're going to eat those peas. No, I'm not. Don't do it. Expect that there's they're not going to want to eat, that everything tastes terrible, and that they're going to lose weight. Just provide healthy things there. You can let your doctor do all the encouraging and the finger shaking. But you be supportive. Yeah, I know, I know. This probably tastes lousy. I heard that this particular thing might be good though. So I made some up for you. You want to try it? it it's, um, I, I hate to always refer back to the two-year-old stage, but um, it was true. <laughs> I love it, Sandra. I think it's great. I think that is like uh, pinpointing it great. But you can't, you cannot change. I mean, we could assist and help and, and try to provide what we can, but we, you cannot change someone's person. You yeah. know, they have to, I mean, it's like just with so many things in life, losing weight or anything, it's a, it's a personal decision. Someone has to want it. You know, and if they don't want it, we could assist them to get to want it but you can't make it happen. And sometimes like a child, they could rebel, right? And they could start moving away because you're pushing too much. So you don't want that to happen either. Well, that would be now a teenager. Now we're getting into the teenage years. <laughs> Our next question, and uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll let you take a, uh, I'll let you take this one first. It says, did you also find it helpful to get close to the nurses um, who could advocate for you when the doctors didn't answer the questions or they rushed you? A very interesting question. I basically lived at the hospital while she was doing her ATG. And what I find out is that it she was getting a reaction, I always made sure that uh, I was there to find the nurses because even though you're ringing for a nurse and you're getting a reaction to the ATG, uh, doesn't necessarily mean anyone's gonna take, be serious or they're gonna call a doctor in. So um, I started to know what she needed and didn't need. It was also helpful to figure out which nurse was which. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to um, ask questions of the new person so that they remember who you are. Uh, but when you're staying for a long period of time, you get friendly with one of the nurses or two of the nurses, and then they rotate off and they have a whole new set to start off with. And the other thing is a lot of people, a lot of the nurses and a lot of doctors aren't really dealing with um, any plastic patient. So it's a cool window of research to always re-educate anyone who walked into the room to make sure that they knew that she had a plastic anemia, not a cancer, because it's usually in the cancer floors where you're being treated and they don't realize uh, a plastic is not what you call a common uh, topic on, on these floors. So it is important to get the nurses to make sure that they know if you have MDS or a plastic or that they're aware so that they make the right decisions. Uh, it, it is very, very important. Um, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Allison or Sandra, would you guys like to help out with that? Yeah, I, I think it's great. I think that you you do have to help be a patient advocate. Um, I use again, this was before COVID and all, but I had a binder. Um, that I had next to Mario's bed in the hospital. And I would write, you know, when his blood pressure, I would write everything down that was happening when they gave him certain meds and all. And it got to the point, because I was still working, um, the nurses would write in my binder when I wasn't there. You know, so they knew that that was something that I liked and they literally would continue it throughout the day. Um, even the doctors, I think you have to become 
comfortable with having those conversations with the doctors. Um, back then I actually was able to stay in the hospital and I would take a shower in the morning. And when the doctors would come in, Maria would say, all right, you know, the water just turned off. Hurry up, be quick, get out of here before she gets out of the shower. I would chase them down the hall with my towel, be like, wait, I have a question. And they turn around and they're like, you know, they would joke with me, say, we were trying to get away from you. So I think you just, they're people too. And they, even though they're busy and they have a lot of patients, whether the nurses or the doctors, they still need to take time to answer your questions and to to assist you. So if they know you well enough and they know that that's what you're going to do, they are going to help you. And if they don't, then you might might not be the right fit, you know. So I think getting to know them and being personal and and having conversations with all of the medical professionals that are working with your loved one, it's very I think it's very important. They they know everything. They have seen it all. They've got such vast experience with so many hundreds of patients. They are the ones that really, really can sit and explain. I know when Mike um, was having, he was in the hospital a lot uh, later on. Uh, but when he first transitioned to leukemia, I didn't know anything about leukemia and the differences. And one of the nurses sat down and drew it on a piece of paper for me. Here's the, the myeloid line and here's how all this works. And Oh, that's how it works. Um, another time he was having a heart, he was never a pill taker much to begin with and then having to take so many pills. He was throwing them up and the nurse explained to me, that's perfectly normal. He's not being difficult. There's something that just sort of flips in their mind and their body, after you take a few, the body just goes, no, that's it. I'm not taking anymore and I'm going to throw them up. Uh, I didn't know that. And I had never read it anywhere. So she said, here's what works. You get applesauce, take a spoon of applesauce, put a couple of pills on. It fools them. The taste is different. The pills just slide right down their throat and there's no issue. And by George, it worked. And here he is four and a half years out of transplant five years, five and a half years out of diagnosis. And he still uses applesauce every day. Um, so and a lot of those lessons you can learn from the nurses. Sandra, again, that's just like a kid. That's why you do to the kids to trick yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Our, our next question is my, my wife, the patient, when we go into appointments, doesn't seem to always tell the physicians mm. what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Did you all <laughs> experience this? And how did you handle that, making sure that the doctor got the whole picture information of what was actually going on? Sandra, would you like to start? Story of my life. I, like Allison, you know, I would, I made detailed notes. I knew everything that was going on when it happened. The doctor would come in. How are you? Are you having any problems? Good. No, everything's fine. No, it isn't. Look at your ankles. They're so swollen up. You can't bend your foot. <laughs> you know? um, he got annoyed with me. And for a while, whoops, did I lose you? No, you're there. I'm there, but I've lost the picture. But the, okay, I've got the sound. Um <laughs> He was annoyed with me and he started hiding things from me, not letting me know. Because when we finally had a conversation about it, he said, I didn't want you to tell the doctor because then the doctor would put me back in the hospital and I don't want to go in the hospital. So there was more to it, m more levels to it. Uh, and when we finally got down to it and I understood, but he had to understand that my job was to look for things like that and to bring it to the doctor's attention, or at least that's what I thought my job was. I don't know if it really was, but for me, it was. Uh, Allison? Yeah, I agree. Again, it's, it's that fine line. And I think it goes by, it's also personality, right? Like, I mean, Mario knows if I'm in there, I'm saying something, <laughs> you know? And I would usually be like, oh, really? Really? Because that didn't happen last week? You know, like I would usually kind of do it like that. But, um, 
you know, again, they have to understand that if they're not honest and tell the doctor what's going on, you know, something that they don't even think is an issue, a doctor or nurse, it might be a red flag for something that might be not going the way it's supposed to be going. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the very beginning though, Mario was so scared you know, when they started asking him questions about what he's done in his past and all that, I learned everything about him because he was, he's like, I, I did pot once. Like he was like, Ugh. you know, so with Mario, I feel like he was more, he, he is very willing to tell them how he's feeling. So for the most part, I think he was good with that. It was just a couple of times that I have to say, oh, but I thought that, you know, so again, you know, you just have to talk to them maybe before the appointment and say, listen, you know, remember this happened or write things down because some pe sometimes we might think they don't want to tell, but maybe it's they actually forgot because, you know, when you're in those rooms, it does get intimidating. Some people aren't comfortable in there and they're nervous. So maybe before this could be a good technique beforehand, you could say, all right, let's write down our questions and then let let's write down some of the symptoms that you've had you know, and then it will be in a piece of paper. And then you go, oh, well, look, we forgot two, or, you know, we forgot that one. So, because we do forget while we're in the office. So maybe writing it like meeting beforehand, having a pre-meeting for your visit. Excellent. Excellent I have a question, Lee. I have a question actually as a comment that came in the chat. One of our um, one of our caregivers asked the question or has made a recommendation to take some time out for yourself as the caregiver to step away from the patient and deal with your emotions away from the patient. Maybe take time to cry or yell at the sky. What are, do you all do during your patients, during the, the dark day, the, the hard days of treatment? What did you all do to deal with your own emotions? I didn't. My, I was focused totally on him. I was able to uh, just put aside any worries that I had. Um, I was annoyed, greatly annoyed with people who would say, well, you need to go take time for yourself. Go get a pedicure. Oh yeah, my husband's trying to die in the hospital and I'm going to go get a pedicure. I don't think so. Oops. Somebody else take it. I got it. <laughs> I, um, I really relied on my, my immediate family and friends um, so I would have conversations with them. Um, I, I do think it's still very important to take care of yourself, um, not just with aplastic anemia or MDS, these types of situations, but I've known plenty of husbands and wives where one was sick, 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 the other one was fine and ended up passing away because of they had a stroke or a heart attack. And they're the one that no one was ever worried about. They weren't sick. You know, so I do think that we have to be still mindful of ourselves. Um, I think that a caregiver has the right to go through different emotions. Um, I feel, you know, I know there's some patients out there, but to the caregivers, you know, you, you are allowed to be angry. You could be angry at your loved one. <laughs> you could just be angry at the universe for making this happen to your family. So it, it is okay. I, I, I mean, I feel it is okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to laugh at things. I mean, one time Mario went to the hospital with serum sickness. He had the nurse like fold his bed up like this, that his, his, his knees were touching his nose. And he's like, okay, I'm comfortable now. I was hysterical laughing. They probably thought I was great. Like, who is this? She's not very, because sometimes you have to laugh at things like that. Like, you know, we would laugh at cyclosporin and, and how horrible it tasted every time he took it. So I, I think that it's okay to experience all of the emotions and to, to go for a run. And like I said, go, go to a friend's house and cry for an hour. Th those are things that and actually, it might even make you better to then care for them, because if you're having feelings of anger and it can even get resentful, right? You might even have resentment. You know, if you don't let that out or talk about it to someone who cares about you and to your loved one, then it's it could backfire. Yeah. And so. it also depends on what stage we're talking about. If you're taking care of someone who is pre-transplant and pretty much self-sufficient, that's one thing. If you're taking care of somebody 
who's in the hospital and chances are they're not going to make it out of the hospital. That's a whole different world. So I don't think you can say one it, that there's a specific way to do it. Everybody's just got to find their their own path through it. It's you're going to end up with PTSD. I feel I know I have. There are certain things that'll happen and it triggers me. And I am back four years ago. Um, so it's I don't recommend. Uh, not doing anything for yourself, but I understand why you wouldn't. I, I felt like I was being disloyal to him somehow if I did something for myself. Kind, kind of sounds stupid now, but there were times that I just, I had to, I just had to press on and not Allison. think of it. Uh, I, think it's also, I think it's also time frame too, like Sandra was saying, but like, if someone is in that, like for the first week or, I mean, I didn't do it, like I didn't feel that way in the very beginning either. But I think that if someone is in the hospital for a long period of time, you know, to, to make that your home, as I had made the comment before that I felt, thought the hospital was my home, you know, after a certain period of time, I think that you do need to start to kind of maybe rethink how you're doing things mm -hmm. just for your own sanity. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Jeff, would you like to uh, chime in on that? Well, one of the things we... I knew that she was okay when not... So for the first year and a half, I never even thought about doing anything else just to make sure that we were together. And we had a dog and a cat, so that made things, uh, that was as long as I had them to take care of and make sure that their mommy was okay and kept on reassuring them. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that I, what I went through, it was just amazing what I was able to accomplish. Uh, never thought of, well, I need to take a break. I had to make sure that she was okay. And uh, spending the time in the hospital with her, going to the doctor's visits, uh, gave me a, a tremendous amount of, of emotional relief. And also, uh, getting back to what you need to do. Before we go to a doctor, I would we'd make a checklist just to make sure that everything that was covered, because it was mentioned that when you get to the doctor's office, you're waiting and waiting, and then you're there, and somewhere along the line, you forget to mention something. So that gave me a feeling of accomplishment to say, oh, by the way, you forgot about this or forgot about that. Uh, I think it's 10 years later that I realized how much emotional stress was put in. But during the initial phase, whatever had to be done, had to be done. I never thought about I need time for myself. I just wanted to make sure that she pulled through. Um, she was what I had. So it wasn't a question, well, let me hang out with the friends. She was my friend. Um, and I needed to make sure that she was okay. And just as long as I knew that I was there to take care of her, um, that gave me a lot of uh, satisfaction. Otherwise, uh, that's all that I have to say is that I, I, just as long as I knew she was okay and I was there for her, that was what was important. I really resonate with those comments, Jeffrey. That's kind of the same way I felt. And I'm the, I'm the bad care, caregiver. No, I don't think it's bad. I think it's a different situation. His wife was ready to die at any minute. And that's a different... Oh, yeah, no, Mario was there. Mario was there. No. <laughs> oh, well then, I don't know. <laughs> do it then. I mean, you know, like I said, this is 12, you know, we're talking years, right? So... That's fine. yeah. How did you manage keeping family members or loved ones and close friends? Um, how did you manage letting them know how your loved one was doing? Because everyone that loves the patient wants to know how was the appointment today, what's going on, and you as the primary caregivers have a lot on your plate. Do you, do you have any tips for caregivers how they can help manage keeping everybody informed about what's going on? Because that's a job in itself. Mm -hmm. 
nowadays with technology, it's definitely, um, you know, even different from just, I mean, we were what, like 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, I used to, I had a group text, you know, I had a, a group text message that I would send, like I had the people that I knew that Mario wanted me to tell things to, and I would just do that. But again, nowadays with um, social media, um, there's so many different <coughs> applications out there that could be used. So I think in today's day, it's very easy just to send out a blast. Um, but also you have to make sure that your the patient wants certain people to know things. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Um, you don't want to be giving information that they may not want to know. I have my oldest daughter who kind of took over that role. And I'm so glad that she did. It gave her something very positive to do, even though we're in Texas and she's in Chicago, um, she was able to put out just the right information uh, and to keep everybody updated. And I really appreciated it because some days I'd get home, I couldn't have written a thing. I would just sit in my chair and stare at a wall wondering, is he gonna make it through tomorrow? Um, so again, it depends on what illness you're dealing with and what stage you're, you're at. At critical times, it's really nice to have somebody else who says, don't worry, I'll take care of that part for you. Sandra, do you think it helped her with um, feeling like that she was helping to care for her dad, even though she couldn't be physically present with you all? Do you Absolutely. think that was helpful for her also yes. to have a, a role um, in, in helping you all. Absolutely. That was her job. My other daughter is a chemistry professor and I was able to say, dad's been given X, Y, Z medication. What is this exactly? What does it do? Um, so that made her feel more involved too. She's, uh, she likes to investigate things and all in all, I think it, it, it went pretty well. We split those things. Not that I did it on purpose it just organically happened well, great uh jeff did you did you have anything you'd like to contribute i think what got through this was once the support that she helped by helping speaking with other people who had a plastic it was a lot easier to deal with the disease then talking to other people don't know what a plastic anemia is. So you try to explain to people and they're not going to get it. Uh, they know she's sick. You tell you're sick. All they want to know is not do research on the web and the clinic. They would, oh my God, she's still alive, type of thing. Because remember back then, it was like it's had a plastic at 18 years. It, it, it's, I, it's, nobody really wanted to know that much about what was going on. All they want to know is she getting well. And it, luckily, with the phone hospital, I was on the phone, and that was able to resolve the issue. But family members, they, well, they would want to know how going, but not the details. And, Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I, I think Allison has a better handle of it, and Sandra has a better handle of it, because they have a larger circle of people to deal with. Uh, so... Thank you. And we are you having a, I, we do have a question from the audience. As a patient, what can I do to help my caregiver prepare for that period of time when I return home from the hospital? Should we talk and write down a plan of issues that may come up in advance so my caregiver isn't overwhelmed? Uh, Sandra, would you like to mm. start with that? That's a good one. I don't know that you really can do that. There's so many different things that can happen. 
after you get out of the hospital. No, I, I can't see the benefit of that. And the, the personality changes so differently, at least it did in our situation. Um, so what Mike might have wanted prior to March, 2016, and then what he wanted in the end of June and July, 2016 were two different things. So personally, that wouldn't have helped us, but it might help somebody else. Uh, Allison? You know, um, Mario didn't have, he didn't, he doesn't have a match. Mario didn't have a bone marrow match, so he did not have a transplant. Um, but, you know, you may also want to reach out to um, a, a good friend. It, I'm sorry, is it the, who is the pay, husband, wife? I don't. Uh, it, this is coming from a gentleman for his, his wife. wife. Right. So maybe. Wife's um, the caregiver. Okay. So maybe if you know, if your wife has a very close person, whether it's a family or a, a friend, maybe you could reach out to that person and just say, could you check in on her sometimes? Um, you know, I'm, I still advocate for, you know, um, time to, you know, to talk to somebody else outside of that. Mm -hmm you know, that caregiver patient um, circle. So maybe that's just something you could yeah. even do too. Just make sure that someone's gonna check in just to make sure she's okay too, because you're gonna be recovering and you're gonna be caring really for your insides and yourself. Um, so just maybe if it would be nice if you had someone check in on her too. We when have... your loved ones were leaving the hospital, did they provide like a list for you guys of, when to call um, for assistance or, yeah. you know, um, discharge papers. Um, did you find that those were sufficient or did you find that you needed more? Uh, maybe those type of things would be helpful in kind of preparing for what you need to do when you're at home. Yeah, absolutely. We had also in, in our transplant unit, we have benefited by a full-time psychologist. And she's been there to see patients as well as family members mm -hmm. before the transplant, during, and then after. And we still can make an appointment with her. And here we are four and a half years out. I can still make an appointment with her and go in and, and talk to her, and I have. Um, also, we had a, a meeting of everybody that was going to be taking care of Mike. And I think this is fairly common, family meetings, the nurses were there, the social workers were there, a uh, doctor, everybody was involved. And they gave us a list of here's, here's what to expect. So I thought we were pretty well prepared between that and the education that I'd given myself through this organization and others. Um, I thought I was just really well prepared. I wasn't, but I thought I was. And our last question will be, now that you are seasoned caregivers, what is the one bit of advice that you would give somebody who is a new caregiver that you think would be most helpful? Allison, would you like to start? I don't know, because I'm the bad caregiver. <laughs> um, Why not? I would say that I feel that you should document, like document the medical things. And I'm sure you've already know. I also feel that you need to take care of your own emotional and physical health. Um, you know, just be mindful of yourself. And again, it's not, you know, it's always making sure they're okay first. It's like being the parent of the child, right? You make sure your child is okay. So you make sure that your loved one is okay, but then do make sure, you know, that you, you are appointments, make sure you get your heart checked, make sure, you know, because if you fail to do those things, it could, you know, turn. So just document and also take care of yourself. Uh, Sandra? She hit that really right on the, the head. Um, Somebody asked me probably a year and a half after transplant, well, when's the last time you saw your doctor? It never even occurred to me. I was so wrapped up in him, I didn't think about it. Now, as it turns out, it was okay and I was fine, but what if it hadn't been? 
you know, we've been married 50 years. We're not spring chickens. Things happen. So I, I can see now that I was so wrapped up in his daily care that I did forget to at least get somebody to check it. So I, I like that, Allison. Thank you. Jeff? Oh, Jeff, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> I remember going to the doctor or the dentist. All I know is I went to her doctor's, her dentist. Uh, I had her checklist in regards to what meds she would take. I would make the list for the doctors, but I don't remember actually taking care of myself. And uh, to this day, I still haven't uh, coordinated in regards to what I need to do. Um, it's you just you in reality i don't think you prepare yourself for what has to be done because you don't know uh, until you're there um and the key is to belong to a support group and that's where i think it's important so that you can bring up the questions um, and the support group could give you a little bit of hint in regards to what to expect because no one's going to react the same way um but I, I think that's where the key is. You can read everything you want, uh, but you, it's, it's still, once you're there, you don't know what's gonna happen. But it's just as long as, the key is just as long as you're there and always attend, make sure that you're at a doctor's appointment. Make sure you always have that list. Make sure that even though you discussed it beforehand, uh, as the caregiver, you're the one that sits there with the pen and the list to check off each of the items to make sure it's done. And in regards to the meds, you have to make sure, because remember, you're not taking every med every day. It can be one every other day. How you, your, your uh, loved one is basically reacting because there's some meds that, uh, if I remember Monday and Wednesdays, she was sound asleep. Tuesdays, Thursdays, the rest of the time she was fine. She'd always say, why am I sleeping? But you took this med on Monday and you took this med on Wednesday. And by knowing that she's okay, it made me feel better and I think it would make a caregiver feel better. Um, so that at least you feel you have some sort of control of what's going on. And I think that's the key. If the caregiver has control that they're doing what they can, that I think emotionally helps tremendously. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Allison, Sandra, and Jeff, for taking the time today for sharing your personal stories and your your loved one stories to uh, help out uh, everyone that uh, participated today um, and those that'll be watching it in the future. So, thank you guys so much for giving of yourselves today. Um, it's greatly appreciated. If you would like to watch this webinar again at a later time, it will be available on our website within two to three business days. If we were not able to get to your question and you'd like to uh, connect with others, uh, please do send an email to help at aamds.org. You can call our helpline at 800-747-2820, extension two, or submit your question or comment on our Facebook page. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, thank you very much for joining us today, making us your resource of choice of, for bone marrow failure diseases. The AAMDSIF Medical Advisory Board and team are here to support you and your family as we have done for the past 36 years. This concludes our program. Thank you, Jeff, Allison, and Sandra. Bye.